Okay, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for Venable's monthly nonprofit webinar. My name is Yossi Ziffer. I'm a partner in Venable's tax and nonprofit group. Our topic today is playing the long game, everything you need to know about restricted gifts and endowments. Not some things or most things you need to know, everything. Uh, over the course of the session, we will discuss the concept of restricted gifts generally, endowments in particular, and some of the interesting opportunities, quandaries, and scenarios that these funds present for nonprofits. And let's introduce our discussion today with a mostly fictional scenario. See if you can tell where the fictional part starts. Uh, next month will mark the 25th anniversary of my college graduation. And in the spring of 1998, I graduated with something called an English major, which seemed like a fine idea at the time. Now, imagine that I wasn't just any English major, but I made it really big. My novels are flying off the shelves. I've written all of the popular poems. I don't know, I've, I've invented a couple words. I'm like the Steve Jobs of English majors, earning hundreds of millions of dollars. It was the best of times, not the worst of times. And now, in anticipation of my 25th graduation anniversary, I approached the fundraising department of my college to discuss the possibility of making a transformative gift to the English department, because young people today have realized that the path to success, happiness, and material wealth is a strong liberal arts education. Like I said, a fictional scenario. So, so how might these discussions proceed? What steps should I take as the donor to ensure that my wishes are fulfilled? What steps should the university take to the best position itself in case by some chance circumstances change in the future and the purpose of my gift is no longer as relevant? How can both parties ensure that their interests are protected and represented while acting in good faith with each other? That's our topic for today, so let's jump in. In one sense, all gifts to charity are restricted. The benefits and privileges of tax-exempt status and the ability to receive charitable contributions that are deductible to the donor are subject inherently to limitations. In order to qualify under Section 501c3, an organization must be organized and operated in furtherance of one or more purposes that the federal government has deemed to be charitable. So when a donor makes a gift to charity, she knows inherently that there are limits under the law as to what the charity can and cannot do with a gift. For example, a donor could not, say, make a gift to charity for the purpose of supporting political candidates who are aligned with the charity's mission, because that's not something that charities are allowed to do. So there are always going to be certain restrictions built in. And furthermore, in a technical sense, the authority of any particular charity to engage in activities is further defined by the provisions of that organization's charter and other governing documents. As we'll see in a few minutes, when a donor makes a gift to charity, the terms of the gift instrument, the document pursuant to which the gift is made, will establish the allowable parameters for how the gift can be used. And in the absence of more specific documentation focused on the gift, the overall governing documents of the charity themselves could be invoked by a donor as a type of gift instrument, establishing her reasonable expectation for how her gift would be used. And from the donor side, you'll sometimes encounter this concern about what, what some folks call mission creep, or the phenomenon of a nonprofit's focus changing over time. The donor may feel that she gave her gift at one point in time when the organization was deeply committed to a cause that was important to the donor, but what if that focus evolves in the future? For some donors, this concern may incentivize them to place more specific limitations, conditions, and restrictions on the gift so that they feel confident that their gift will continue to be used for purposes that they deem important and worthwhile. And incidentally, from the nonprofit's perspective, one way to preserve flexibility on this point is to ensure that your governing documents themselves, the charter, the bylaws, so forth, include more than just narrowly defined purposes. And even if an organization is principally focused on a particular 
cause or activity, we always encourage the inclusion of broad catch-all language in governing documents for exactly this reason. So as to retain discretion to the present and future organizational leadership to best determine the ways that the organization can meet the needs of its community and constituencies. So in some respects, all gifts to charity are going to be restricted. But of course, our topic today goes further. In the sense that the term is typically used, a restricted gift is subject to additional gift particular, gift specific restrictions as agreed to uh, by and between the donor and the charity. Once a gift is made by a donor to an organization for an agreed upon purpose, the organization is legally bound to use the gift for that purpose. And it makes no difference which party introduced or initiated the concept of the restriction. Sometimes a donor will approach an organization with a clearly defined objective, like my hypothetical scenario where I approached the college about making a gift to the English department. But in other cases, it may be the organization that initiates the restriction. Maybe the organization is running a capital campaign to improve its campus or its fundraising to support a new research initiative or another project. The organization may go out and cultivate gifts from donors through fundraising efforts that specifically identify and represent to the donors how their gifts will be used. And in both models, whether it's a donor initiated restriction or an organizational initiated restriction, once the gift has been made by the donor and accepted by the charity subject to that shared understanding of how the gift is to be used, the organization is legally obligated to deploy the gift in furtherance of the stated purposes. And here the law is heavily uh, favoring and, and protective of donor intent in this, in this regard. The organization can't represent to the donor that a donation will be used one way, and then later unilaterally change its plans and decide to embark on a different approach. That would effectively be a bait and switch uh, with respect to the donor, and the state attorney general would have authority to compel the organization to abide by its original commitment to the donor. So what types of restrictions can a donor impose? Well, pretty much anything. Again, like we said before, subject to the permissible uh, parameters of what a charity can do. But, but within those boundaries, whatever the charity and the donor agree to is fair game. And most typically, the restrictions will pertain to the usage of the gift. And this could be in a number of ways. Go back again to my hypothetical scenario. I was making a gift to my college to be used for the English department. So the college can't simply decide in a later year, because times have changed, to start using that gift for computer science or something else like that. And even within the example of the English department, perhaps I will have placed further specifications on the use of the gift. Maybe the gift has to be used to endow a professorship or to award an annual uh, prize for the best thesis or whatever else I may have stipulated. Another type of uh, restriction, as we'll get to shortly, will apply not only to the what, but the how. If the gift is made as an endowed gift, then the organization will be subject to additional terms on the rate and manner in which it spends the gift. Or maybe I'm a very hands-on particular donor, and I wish to stipulate how my gift will be invested. Or maybe I've made a gift of a particular type of asset and I'm placing restrictions on whether that asset could be sold or whether it has to be retained by the organization. So as you can see, the restriction or restrictions on a particular gift will really be the product of the donor's wishes and the organization's amenability to those wishes and any negotiations that occur between the donor and the nonprofit in resolving any differences of views that might arise. And for all of these reasons, it's crucially important that the organization ensure that any restricted gift has been vetted by the appropriate individuals or bodies within the organization. Because once the donor has made the gift subject to a restriction, it's gonna to be too late to then determine whether the organization is able to abide by those limits. 
So if a nonprofit organization, charity or otherwise, maintains an active fundraising arm, it's advisable for the organization to adopt a gift acceptance policy. And even more than adopting the policy, it's really advisable for the organization to abide by that policy. And there's no, there's no legal requirement for a nonprofit to have a gift acceptance policy, but it's certainly a best practice and, and very beneficial to all of the parties to create that shared understanding, an established set of parameters and procedures around how the organization solicits gifts, what type of gifts are acceptable to the organization, and what forms of approval are required as a precondition to accepting particular gifts. And especially when dealing with gifts that are subject to donor-initiated restrictions on usage, if the restrictions are detailed and extensive, then your organization, if, if you're on the, on the donee side of, of the table, your organization should consider what form of authorization and approvals are necessary. In some instances, it may be appropriate to bring the question to your board to ensure that the organization and its professional leadership are in step with the board and lay leadership around what terms are acceptable, which limitations might be problematic, and so forth. And of course, this can sometimes put fundraising professionals in a delicate spot, because you can imagine where the fundraiser on the donor cultivation side is working diligently to cultivate a gift from, from a major donor. And then the board says, well, we have, we have concerns with the particular restriction that's, that's being discussed or, or proposed. And then the fundraiser is forced to go back to the donor and suggest certain changes as, as demanded or suggested by the board. But again, far better to have those discussions early on and in a clear and direct manner, rather than to be retracing your steps later on uh, after accepting the gift and then discovering that the donor had one thing in mind and the board then has concerns. So that outcome doesn't, uh, doesn't benefit anyone. So once the donor and nonprofit are ready to finalize a restricted gift, it's critical that they enter into a well-crafted gift agreement. And this is really important for both parties because putting the agreement in writing will focus everyone on the definitive terms of the agreement and thereby help avoid any misunderstandings and hopefully, hopefully prevent disagreements in the future. Uh, before before uh, going on on the gift agreements, just uh, responding to one question that, that was raised, uh, are there any peculiar, peculiarities for foreign grant recipients? Um, that's... Uh, that's a good question. Um, if the grantee is a foreign organization, um, the laws of that jurisdiction may apply to that situation. And we're, we're going to get to the applicable law a little bit later on in this uh, in this discussion. Uh, you really do have to be aware of the law that governs the particular jurisdiction in which the parties find themselves. And so making grants uh, to a nonprofit in, in another country certainly could change the calculus of what the respective rights and, and obligations of the parties are. Now going back to the, uh, to the gift agreement. Um, first and foremost, of course, the gift agreement should spell out the basic elements of the gift. How much is being given, the payment schedule, the form in which the gift will be paid, et cetera. But when you're dealing with a restricted gift, just as important as those terms uh, will be the statement of the restriction. And here, you're going to want to pay careful attention to how the restriction is, is written out, how, how it's drafted on paper. And it's important to recognize that the previous discussions and understandings that have taken place through the, the negotiating process and the gift, gift cultivation process will fade into the background. And they'll become largely immaterial once there's a written agreement. Going forward, the terms of the contract, the gift agreement will, will govern. And from a nonprofit's perspective, even if you are agreeing to a restricted gift, there's certainly room to negotiate for alternative uses. Sometimes an organization may seek to split the gifts, 
where the majority of, of the gift is used for the primary purpose, the purpose where the restriction is placed, but some smaller percentage can be used for general operating needs of the nonprofit. Again, everything is subject to the negotiation and consent of, of the parties. Additionally, to best protect the nonprofit, the gift agreement should also address what happens if in the future, circumstances change and perhaps the originally stated purpose becomes less viable. And there are different ways to approach this issue. And we'll come to some of that discussion later on in the session. Uh, but suffice it to say that the different approaches may not be mutually exclusive. One approach could be to expressly state an alternative backup purpose and the conditions under which the organization may or must pivot to that alternative purpose. Or a different approach would be to specifically identify not the alternative purpose, but the process the organization will undertake in the event that a change becomes necessary or advisable. From the donor side, sometimes a donor may seek to build in additional safeguards as well to ensure that the originally stated purpose is always upheld, even in the event that it becomes impracticable for this nonprofit to do so. So whereas the nonprofit may be interested in carving out additional flexibility, the donor may want to put in additional safeguards to ensure that the original stated purpose is, is upheld in the future. So for example, a donor might propose a provision stating that in the event this organization determines it can no longer reasonably carry out the original purpose, then this organization agrees to regrant the funds to some other charity, to another organization that is willing uh, and able to abide by the originally stated restriction. Again, all of these things can be, can be negotiated and depending on which side of the table you're on uh, will be which approach uh, is, is in your best interest. Other terms in gift agreements may include reporting obligations, such as how the nonprofit keeps the donor apprised of how the gift is being used. And particularly in the case of a gift that's subject to an ongoing restriction, the donor may seek informational access to the nonprofit to verify that the gift continues to be used in the agreed upon manner. Anything else that the parties wish to memorialize in connection with the donation should also be included in the gift agreement. As much as possible, you would wanna contain all of the material terms in one document. So for example, if the gift entitles the donor to naming rights or other forms of donor recognition, those details should be spelled out. Uh, and on that point, the nonprofit, the donee, should ensure that it's clear on what form or forms of recognition it's conferring, how that recognition will be implemented, and perhaps what rights the nonprofit reserves to revoke such recognition in the event of future changes. Additionally, a point that's worth considering for inclusion in a gift agreement is whether the rights of the donor might be conveyed to others after the donor is gone. As we'll continue to see throughout our discussion, the law protects donor intent, but somewhat ironically, the law generally does not provide for a successor party to exercise the rights of the donor after the original donor is gone. And therefore, absent a provision in the gift agreement to the contrary, once the donor is deceased or otherwise unavailable, the nonprofit would typically not have a party with whom to discuss any changes or unexpected developments. However, if the gift agreement specifically provides for a successor to the donor, or at a minimum, a mechanism for appointing a successor to the donor, then those terms will govern with respect to the gift that is subject to that agreement. Now, this is a little bit of a double-edged sword, and each side may or may not be interested in building that type of flexibility into the contract. From the nonprofit perspective, you'll want to carefully evaluate whether including that type of provision is desirable, because in some instances, it may be advantageous to continue to have a point of contact who is authorized to represent the interests of the donor and to consent to changes. But in other cases, even if there was a very solid established relationship between the charity and the original donor, 
your organization may not be as assured of having a similar experience with a successor. And therefore, the nonprofit will want to exercise discretion in deciding whether to propose that type of arrangement in the contract. And likewise, from the donor's perspective, there may or may not be a desire to appoint a successor depending on the donor's confidence in the successor's ability and reliability to continue representing the donor's interests and likely viewpoints. So bottom line, a gift agreement will function as a contract between the nonprofit and the donor, and whatever terms the parties agree to will, generally speaking, apply. So as, as we said before, whichever side of the gift transaction you find yourself, take good care to ensure that your party's interests are represented in the gift agreement. Uh, from the nonprofit's perspective, this will generally include trying to retain as much flexibility and as much protective language as possible to position the organization to continue using the restricted gift effectively, even if there are changes in the future. Um, question was posed whether a court could uh, appoint a successor to, to the donor. Um, if the court were to do so, I suppose that that would be that would be binding, but typically the law uh, does not recognize the concept of of a successor. And in some states, uh, the applicable statute that that will come to um, specifically state that the rights of the donor do not pass on to uh, to other successors. And so, if if that type of arrangement is is desired, the best approach. Is to is to build that into into the gift agreement itself. Uh, another question that was raised is: absent a successor to the donor, who has standing or the ability to protect the donor's former interests? Uh, and and here may touch on this uh, a little bit later. Uh, ironically, even while the donor is alive, once the donor has made a completed gift, uh, generally speaking, the enforcement of of restricted gifts is handled by the state attorney general. And, and we'll, we'll come to that point later on in, in a few different ways. But on one hand, the donor has a contract that she entered into with, with the charity, with the nonprofit, and the donor is a party to, to that contract. On the other hand, the very nature of, of a charitable gift is that the donor has parted with, with the gift. It's a completed gift to to the nonprofit, to the charity. Um, and therefore, uh, in, in terms of upholding the intent of that type of arrangement, it typically falls within the jurisdiction of the attorney general, the state attorney general. And if, if a donor had a concern that, uh, that the contract, that the gift agreement was not being upheld, uh, the donor's best recourse would be to refer that concern to the state attorney general and have the AG seek to enforce uh, seek to enforce the terms of, of the agreement. Um, before leaving the topic of restricted gifts in, in general, it's worth noting that, that in some instances, a restriction could go too far and effectively frustrate the purposes of both the donor and the institution. And to illustrate this, let's go back to my original hypothetical. Say that my gift to my college's English department is designated to be used for scholarships for aspiring English majors. But I, as the donor, want to stipulate that the school can review the initial applicants, but I get to interview the finalists and I get to cast the deciding vote on which students will receive scholarships. That's a type of restriction that even if it was put in the gift agreement, and while it may appear attractive to the donor, it actually will undermine the intended objective of making a valid charitable contribution in the first place. Because under IRS principles, the donor in that instance, me, uh, has not ceded sufficient control over the gift, over the money, to the institution. And if donor-imposed restrictions are so extensive that the, don the donor is deemed to continue to hold enforceable rights of ownership with respect to the gift, then the IRS could conclude that the gift was actually not a gift at all. It was an incomplete transfer and the donor would not be entitled to a charitable deduction with respect to that contribution. 
So when negotiating the terms of a restricted gift with a donor, it's important for both sides to make sure that the nature of those restrictions doesn't go so far as to short circuit the intended contri contribution itself. So just as, as a quick recap, so far we've been speaking in general about restricted gifts and the ways that organizations should think how they navigate those cases with their donors. The law protects donor intent and a nonprofit will be held accountable to continue abiding by the restrictions that it agreed to in accepting the gift. Strong internal processes at the organization are recommended for vetting restricted gifts and the terms of those gifts should be memorialized in a detailed grant agreement. And keeping those concepts in mind, we'll now hone in on a specific type of restricted gift endowments. Before moving on, just uh, one quick piece of housekeeping. Uh, for CLE purposes, uh, there is a, a passcode uh, to use, and that code is restricted2023, the word restricted, and the number is 2023. I'll mention that again at the end of, of the webinar. So now let's, let's focus on endowments. An endowed gift or an endowment consists of institutional assets that are not wholly expendable on a current basis. That means that the organization can access those funds from time to time to address financial needs, but the manner in which the endowment is deployed must also consider the fact that the endowment is designed to last indefinitely in perpetuity. Going back to the framework that we established earlier with regard to restricted gifts generally, an endowment should be viewed as a particular subset of restricted gifts where the restriction pertains not only to what you do with the gift, but the ways in which the institution can spend the money. So recall that the restriction uh, can be initiated by a donor or a by nine profit. And that's the case here as well. So if an organization conducts a fundraising campaign to build its endowment and donors contribute to that campaign, subject to that understanding, then those contributions will be treated as restricted gifts for the endowment. But one notable exception that, that we should just identify off the bat is that there is a difference between donor-designated endowments versus board-designated endowments. And when the endowment restriction is imposed by the donor, and here that would include uh, a situation where the donor is responding to a charitable solicitation for an endowed gift. So it could be initiated by either side, donor or charity, but the gift is being made by the donor with the understanding that it will be used for the endowment, then those amounts are treated as true endowments. And all of the restricted gift rules apply there. And all the issues that we're about to discuss will apply to those donor restricted amounts. Conversely, if the board of the nonprofit of its own initiative set aside excess funds, deciding to hold those amounts as an endowment, meaning that it's holding those amounts subject to self-imposed restrictions on expenditure, but it's money that the organization already had. Maybe this was a particularly uh, efficient year and, and revenues came in above, above expenses and the board wants to set aside some funds as an endowment for future use in, in case of need, then those amounts would be viewed as quasi-endowed funds and they are not subject to all of the same restrictions because there, just as the board imposed the restriction on those assets in the first place, the board would also could also in the future choose to lift the restriction. So it's important to keep track of which funds are treated as endowments because the donors of those funds contributed them subject to that understanding versus which funds the organization itself has set aside of its own accord. And if the two became so integrated that, that you weren't able to decouple them anymore, if they weren't separately tracked, then an organization would need to treat everything as donor restricted endowments and, and all the endowment rules would, would apply. Whereas if the board designated amounts are, are carefully and separately tracked, then there will be additional flexibility in how to, how to handle those amounts in the future and if whether the organization might want to lift the restriction in the future. So the law that applies to the investment, management, and expenditure of endowments is 
the Uniform Prudent Management of Institutional Funds Act, or MIFA. And as, as the name suggests, a MIFA is, it's a uniform act, it's a model act. It was developed originally uh, not by any particular state, but by a body called the Uniform Law Commission. And so it took place through a more academic or scholarly process and outside of any particular state's legislative process. But then the states one by one adopted UPMIFA, or maybe more precisely, they adopted variations of UPMIFA and incorporated it into their respective statutes. And now all told, 49 states plus DC have adopted UPMIFA, the only exception being Pennsylvania, which has its own separate set of rules on this point. And as a quick piece of history, UPMIFA mm -hmm. replaced a different predecessor model law, which was called the Uniform Management of Institutional Funds Act, or UMIFA. So if you're paying attention, you can see that the difference between the old law and the new law is the letter P, which stands for prudent. And we'll come back to that prudent concept momentarily. So what was, what was wrong with the old law? So one of the central features of UMIFA, the old, the predecessor law, was that when it came to endowments, institutions were allowed to spend only those amounts of the endowment that exceeded the so-called historic dollar value of the fund. And this meant that whatever amounts the donor or donors had contributed to the fund constituted the principal or the historic dollar value. And that amount represented a bright line that organizations could not pass when expending amounts from the endowment. But over time, the prominence conferred on a fund's historic do dollar value became problematic. This in a couple of ways. For one thing, by establishing a cap on how much could be spent from an endowment at any given time, the historic dollar value concept may have resulted in overspending in some instances, because as long as the fund didn't dip below that bright line, organizations assumed that all expenditures were, were permissible. And then at the opposite extreme, the historic dollar value concept could also sometimes render an endowment completely unavailable unavailable. Because at a time when the market drops significantly and the value of the assets comprising uh, the endowment falls below the historic dollar value, then this would result in a so-called underwater endowment. And the organization would not be able to access endowment funds at all until sometime in the future when the investments appreciated back up enough to push the account balance above the historic dollar value line. You can imagine this issue became particularly relevant during the 2008 recession and its aftermath, but it really had already been identified previously by the drafters of MIFA as a significant concern. And again, ironically, at times of the greatest significant economic stress, when an organization might need to avail itself of its endowment, under the old law, the endowment that was meant to provide long-term security could ironically be rendered unavailable. And so to alleviate these concerns, UPMIFA, the new law, abandoned the reliance on historic dollar value and introduced that letter P, concept of prudence. As we'll see, the manner in which a nonprofit would now be permitted to deploy its endowment would be measured by an overall standard of prudent expenditure rather than based on any fixed number. Now, while some aspects of UPMIFA apply specifically to endowments, we'll see that many of its provisions apply more broadly to all institutional funds and to restricted gifts, whether endowed or not. And in that way, UPMIFA provides a framework for how charities manage, invest, and expend various types of funds. Of course, nonprofits are also subject to other federal and state laws, including general corporate laws that establish fiduciary duties that boards of directors owe their organizations, and UPMIFA supplements those standards. So it is, it is part of the body of law that applies to organizations and their decision makers. So for, for endowed funds and other types of institutional funds, UPMIFA establishes standards for how the organization should manage and invest. And the UPMIFA standards create a framework for how those functions should be carried out provided that the donor and organization have not separately agreed to a specific management and investment plan for the donor's contribution. As we said before, you could always agree to a separate set of, of ground rules for a particular gift in a gift agreement. 
When it comes to establishing a standard for managing and investing funds, uh, MIFA largely parrots the general fiduciary duty known as the duty of care, namely that individuals managing and investing the organization's funds should do so in good faith and with the care that an ordinarily prudent person would exercise under similar circumstances. And beyond that, UPMIFA favors diversifying investments. And much of the commentary around UPMIFA refers to the drafter's desire to apply a so-called modern portfolio theory to how charities invest their funds. Of course, facts and circumstances of any particular situation should be considered. And therefore there could be scenarios where diversification might be disfavored or minimized. But as a general rule of thumb, UPMIFA favors diversified investments subject to, subject to an overall investment strategy adopted by the organization. And in this regard, boards should ensure that in making investment decisions, they involve individuals, whether they be board members or committee members or outside advisors who have the requisite knowledge and expertise to gauge the needs and realities of the organization and how best to craft an overall investment philosophy and strategy that makes sense for the organization. And UPMIFA directs organizations to consider all relevant factors when managing and investing funds. But on the slide here, I've listed specific factors that UPMIFA identifies as necessary to consider to the extent that they are relevant. And we could discuss each factor, but in the interest of time, suffice it to say that the organization should evaluate everything that it deems to be relevant, whether specifically listed by UPMIFA or otherwise, when making investment decisions involving institutional assets. So let's turn back now to what we were discussing a few minutes ago regarding UPMIFA's approach to how an organization can and should deploy its endowments. As we noted, an endowment is always subject to competing considerations. The present needs of the organization, which could be addressed by appropriating amounts from the endowment and expending them to meet present needs, versus the long-term growth and preservation of the endowment, which favors the ongoing accumulation of assets and value within. And unlike you, MIFA, before it, MIFA does not draw a line in the sand to establish how much can be spent at any given time. Rather, MIFA directs organizations to utilize their endowments prudently and to appropriate amounts for expenditure to the extent that it is prudent to do so. Again, much like the approach taken with regard to how to invest, uh, MIFA lists a variety of factors to take into consideration when evaluating how much to spend at any given time from the endowment. And in fact, you see, comparing the two slides, several of the factors listed for this assessment are the same in both cases. Consider the same factors about how to invest and how to spend because they're really two sides of the same coin when it comes to an endowment because an endowment is always straddling those, those two considerations, how to provide for the organization, but also how to grow the endowment. And just to note a couple of the factors as they arise in the context of choosing how much to appropriate for expenditure, note that MIFA says to consider the other assets of the institution, as well as its investment policy. And what this really means is that the decision of how to deploy your endowment, how much, again, I keep using the same term, how much to appropriate for expenditure, to how much to siphon off from the endowment to make available for current needs should always be made in the context of a broader holistic view of the organization's resources. Now, a couple of interesting points to note about how UPMIFA operates, particularly against the backdrop of its predecessor law. And, and really, some of these factors were much more relevant when MIFA was, was first adopted, but they, they remain relevant today. For one thing, by its terms, MIFA applied retroactively, which means that when a given state adopted MIFA, it applied not only to endowments created or funded after the date of MIFA's enactment, but it also applied retroactively to endowments that were already in existence, maybe existed for years or decades prior to MIFA's adoption. And so, Really, it was a complete sea change at the time that, that a given state would, would implement and adopt up MIFA because it fundamentally changed how organizations were able to deploy their financial resources, including resources that existed for 
significant periods of time. Further, as has been a theme throughout our discussion, a donor and institution can always contractually agree to their own terms and conditions, which means, in this context, that if a donor and an institution specifically agree to create an endowment that operates under the old model, the historic dollar value standard, they are free to do so. But in order to do so, the terms of the gift agreement are gonna to need to be really clear uh, and explicit on this point. Because what MIFA says is that generalized terminology in a gift agreement re uh, regarding the creation of an endowment, or if the gift agreement includes instructions to use income and preserve principle, that type of general terminology will create an endowment, but will not limit the generalized authority that MIFA now confers on organizations to prudently appropriate amounts for expenditure. So again, if the gift agreement says this gift is meant to be held as an endowment and the endowment should be preserved and only expend income, the upshot of that type of agreement in an MIFA world is that uh, the organization can actually invade principle, even though the gift agreement directed to expend income, because that terminology is deemed to create an endowment, but not modify the authority that, that UPMIFA confers on organizations to determine how much is prudent to spend at any given point. So if I was drafting a gift agreement where the donor and the institution had agreed that the endowment was to be managed and operated subject to the prior historic dollar value standard, I would need to affirmatively state that standard in the agreement and make clear that the parties were intentionally overriding the general authority that MIFA confers on organizations to expend principle when deemed prudent to do so. Now, in considering how much is prudent to spend uh, at any given point, the model act of MIFA, the, the model language that each state considered uh, when, when choosing to adopt MIFA, included an optional provision that some states chose to adopt while others didn't. And this provision establishes a rebuttable presumption of imprudence for any expenditure from an endowment in excess of 7%. And that concept of a rebuttable presumption is that the burden of proof would be placed on the organization to show why its facts and circumstances render the presumption inapplicable. But in the absence of such compelling facts, an organization choosing to spend more than 7% from its endowment would be presumed to act imprudently uh, because presumably such an expenditure would unduly prioritize present cash needs over the long-term preservation of, of the endowment fund. And perhaps not surprisingly, MIFA clarifies that even if an expenditure in excess of 7% is presumed to be imprudent, the inverse is not the case. Namely, MIFA does not affirmatively suggest that expenditures of less than 7% are prudent. Rather, an organization always has to establish on the basis of relevant facts and circumstances that whatever amount it's choosing to expend, 4%, 5%, 6.5%, .5%, uh, is prudent based on, based on its reality. So there's no presumption of prudence to counterbalance the presumption of imprudence. And in those states that have chosen to adopt this provision as part of their MIFA statutes, the 7% cap is not measured simply on the basis of the current fund balance. Rather, it's 7% of the average fund balance computed at least quarterly and over a period of years, typically three or more years. And in this regard, relatively minor ups and downs in the fund balance can be smoothed out by averaging the fund value over a period of years, creating a more substantiated and less arbitrary figure off of which to compute the 7% figure. So as, as we said, this presumption of imprudence, the 7% concept was included as an optional feature of UPMIF and on the slide, I've listed some of the states that did and did not choose to include this provision. Obviously, I haven't covered all the states. Uh, but just by way of example, New York has the 7% figure, although it smooths the fund balance over a period of five years rather than three, which is more customary. California adopted the 
uh, presumption of imprudence, but specifically excluded educational institutions from being subject to that standard. And Maryland, where I'm based, adopted the 7% presumption as well. And it adds in an additional requirement that if an organization determines its circumstances to justify spending in excess of 7%, then the organization must notify the Maryland Attorney General of that scenario. And as, as noted at the bottom, some of the jurisdictions uh, that did not incorporate a 7% presumption uh, include DC, Massachusetts, Florida, and Illinois, uh, among others. So we've spent, we spent a lot of time talking about how restricted gifts are created, some of the considerations that arise in connection with restricted gifts, and how endowments represent a particular type of restricted gift with their own sets of rules. But what happens when despite everyone's best efforts, the restrictions uh, outlive their intended effect? If there's anything that we've learned over the last few years, it's that we certainly cannot predict the future and things change all the time. As such, there certainly can be instances when a restricted gift is created with all good intentions and ideas, but future developments run counter to what the parties envisioned when those restrictions were first put into place. And here too, uh, MIFA has a lot to say. First, it, it should be clear, these rules that we're talking about now, the modification of restrictions, will apply not only to endowments, but to any type of gift that is subject to donor-imposed restrictions. As we said earlier, board-restricted assets are not subject to these rules, but any type of donor-restricted assets are. And Again, as it should be intuitive based on what we've been discussing, an organization can always modify a restriction if the organization obtains the consent of the donor. And MIFA makes this point clear. So just as the organization and the donor were free to create the restriction on the gift in the first place, so too, if there's a, a meeting of the minds and, and they're on the same page, they could mutually agree to modify, alter, or even entirely remove the restriction in the future. As long as both parties are on board, all options are available. But the trickier question, more interesting question, is what happens if the donor is not available? What happens if the donor is deceased? What options are available to the nonprofit uh, to address a restricted gift that has become problematic? And here, uh, MIFA provides that an institution can petition a court to release or modify the restriction under certain limited circumstances. And the standards for when and how the court may alter such a restriction depend on the specific nature of that restriction in the first place. First, if the fund in question is subject to a restriction on its management or investment, then the court can agree to modify that restriction if the restriction has become impracticable or wasteful, or if it impairs the management or investment of the funds, or if there are circumstances that were likely not anticipated by the donor such that the restriction must be modified in order to further the original purposes of the gift. Second, if the fund in question is subject to a restriction on the purpose or use of the fund, then the court may agree to modify the restriction if it's become unlawful, impracticable, impossible, or wasteful. And in both of the categories listed above, a restriction on management and investment or a restriction on use and purpose, the, the criteria that I've presented are those that are spelled out in the Model Act version of a MIFA. But this is one of the areas where states have tweaked the standards. And so depending on the state in which an organization finds itself, um, it will be very important to look at, a, at uh, what the applicable state statute says for when a restriction can be modified or released. And sometimes there will be different standards uh, you know, from, from what the Model Act lists. Now, even, even when requesting court approval of a modification, let's say the statute permits an organization to do so, the modification that's proposed by the organization should be shown to be consistent with the charitable purposes in the gift agreement. And thus, to the extent that the modification can be shown as much as possible to further the original charitable purposes of the donor and to adhere as closely as feasible to those original restrictions, a court may be more likely to approve that modification. 
when when an institution wishes to go to court to seek a modification of a give of a restriction, the institution must under MIFA give notice to the state attorney general, and the attorney general will be a party to that court proceeding. And in my experience, the best approach is certainly to engage the attorney general's office early on in the process and to explain the situation to them in advance rather than simply serving notice once the petition has been filed in court. And in this way, the institution can seek to ensure that the AG will be supportive of the request and not raise objections that would make it more difficult to obtain court approval. In some instances, if the nonprofit can submit its request to the court already signaling that the attorney general supports the, the, uh, the motion, then the court may even approve that request on paper without convening a formal hearing. So really, any time an institution wishes to pursue a formal modification of a fund restriction, establishing a good working relationship with the attorney general's office is, is key. Another variable uh, among a few different states of MIFA statutes is whether the donor must also receive notice of the institution's request. And if you think about it, this is pretty interesting because recall that a nonprofit and the donor can always mutually agree to modify a restriction. And if the organization and the donor have agreed to modify that restriction, then no court approval would be necessary in the first place. So in states like New York and California, where the statute says that the institution must give notice of its court petition to the donor, it would seem that if you're already going to court at that point, it seems like in that case, it must be a scenario where the donor had not yet consented to the modification of the restriction and thereby setting up a potentially interesting dynamic in, in the court hearing. Conversely, in states like Maryland, uh, the statutory standard for when an institution can pursue a court approved modification is specifically limited to those scenarios where donor consent is unavailable, such as due to the death, disability, or unavailability of the donor, or if it's practically impossible to identify the donor. So in a state like Maryland, if a donor is identifiable and available, but the donor refused to consent to the modification of a restriction, a court may not have the authority to override the donor's veto of that modification. So again, focusing on the specific contours of your state's statute and what the elements are for when a court can modify a restriction become really important. AMIFA also provides a streamlined process for releasing or modifying the restrictions on funds that are comparatively small and old. And this means that in some cases, the expenses associated with obtaining court approval of a restriction uh, modification may not be justifiable in light of the remaining balance of the fund in question. And for these types of funds, uh, MIFA allows an institution to unilaterally decide to release or modify a restriction. In order to qualify for this prong of a MIFA, the fund in question must have a balance not exceeding a statutorily specified maximum, generally either fifty dollars or $100,000. The fund has to be at least 20 years old, and the institution must be able to, uh, in good faith, determine that the proposed new use of the fund will be consistent with the charitable purposes in the original gift instrument. And if a fund satisfies these three elements, then the institution could go ahead and modify or release the restriction um, without going to court, but it does still have to provide the attorney general with notice of its proposed action. So no court proceeding, uh, and you don't need affirmative attorney general consent, uh, but the AG is entitled to receive notice. Um, and of course, once the AG has been notified, if that office were to raise a concern or objection, um, the, the nonprofit, the organization would need to respond to those concerns. But assuming that no concerns or objections are raised, then once the statutorily specified waiting period has elapsed here in Maryland at 60 days, then no further steps are needed and the institution could then go ahead and modify or release the restriction in, in question. But just to be clear, even for the small old funds that qualify for this exception, a threshold for, for availing yourself of, of, this, uh, of this approach 
is that the institution must reach a good faith determination that the original restriction has become unlawful, impossible, impracticable, et cetera. So the organization can't simply remove a restriction from a fund because it's small and old, there still has to be an underlying justification for doing so. On, on the next two slides, we're, we're running close to time here, so we're gonna, gonna speed up, but just listed uh, various planning considerations that may arise in connection with endowments and restricted gifts and some, some interesting uh, planning ideas for organizations, such as whether to create a separate legal entity to hold endowments. Benefits would be to insulate those assets from liabilities, but on the flip side, there will be additional administrative responsibilities of, of now having multiple uh, multiple entities and maybe your board of, of the operating charity might feel cut off from the, uh, from the decisions being made with respect to the endowment. Um, sometimes organizations raise questions about borrowing from endowments. That's um, a somewhat somewhat tenuous concept and, and the law doesn't really provide uh, for a mechanism from borrowing from endowments, but, but there are situations where it's, uh, those questions are, are understandable. Um, and as, as we said before, who has standing to enforce the terms of a restricted gift? And generally speaking, it's going to be uh, the state attorney general. Um, the donor may not have individual standing to enforce a restricted gift, but it certainly could uh, refer the matter to the AG. And separate and apart from legal standing, obviously organizations that are active in fundraising uh, will, will be very mindful of the political considerations of, of maintaining uh, good donor relations. And in closing, the last few slides of, of, uh, of the presentation present a few case studies uh, designed to illustrate some of the concepts that we've discussed and the ways in which organizations may find themselves in unexpected scenarios involving restricted gifts and endowments. And really these are the types of scenarios um, that, that make this topic so, so interesting because they don't always lend themselves to obvious or easy answers. And uh, again, we're, we're coming up on, on uh, the end of the session, so we won't go through all of these, uh, all of these case studies directly, but as, as a general rule of thumb, uh, consider all of the available facts and circumstances, the realities facing the organization, and the possible risks associated with different approaches. In some instances, it may be beneficial or advantageous to initiate discussions with the state attorney general to seek that office's um, input on, on what an organization is considering and see if you can get some type of affirmation that the attorney general thinks that, that a particular approach is, uh, is advisable or justified under, under your circumstances. And of course, conferring with, with legal counsel is always advised, both in terms of ensuring that all viable options are being considered as well as demonstrating that reasonable care standard that's expected of boards and, and fiduciaries when managing charitable and nonprofit assets. Uh, so, with that, we're uh, we're right at the uh, at the designated time for the end of of the session. Um, I, I know that several questions have been submitted in in the chat um, that that we didn't get to, and and I apologize for that please feel free to reach out to me. Um, uh, my contact information is, is here at the end of, of the slides and certainly be happy to discuss particular situations that you and your organizations may be considering. Thank you for joining us. Have a good day.